Good morning, class. So it is 9.30 and time to get rolling here as we have the big push to get through all this material by the end of the semester. And I think we're doing pretty good actually here. So let me get into presentation mode. Okay, so uh, we're getting down pretty close to the end of this uh, uh, control valve sizing uh, uh, presentation. And we've got uh, examples three, four, and five to get through here before this is uh, completed. So let's move on to uh, example number three. So you see we have uh, three uh, coils, three different piping circuits. You know, we have to get water from the pump through coil one and back to the pump. And then like I said, that circuit, uh, I guess number one, and then we got to get from the pump through coil two and back to the pump. That would be circuit two and then from the pump through uh, coil three and back to the pump. So this is a direct return. So we know we're potentially going to have balancing issues here. Uh, okay, so uh, of the three circuits in this example, number two has the highest pressure drop and that's the one we always go to first. So we see number two is the, has the highest flow rate, it's uh, 60 GPM. And that entire circuit from the pump through the coil and back to the pump, that's what they're, they mean by this, has 14 feet of head. Uh, and we have to add the uh, control valve. So we're gonna size the control valve for this. Uh, let's see. And Dad, I forgot my calculator again. I keep doing that. And Tristan just walked in. He's going to get set up. So I'm going to go back to my office and get my calculator. I did this last time too. I'll be right back. Okay, I am back. So uh, bullet two here, selecting the closest available valve for a uh, greater than 10 foot pressure drop at 60 GPM. So the result of that, he says, is gonna be a two inch valve with a CV of 26. Well, let's just run back through this calculation real quick. Remember 10 foot is the minimum uh, allowable uh, wide open pressure drop across uh, these control valves <clears throat> and these two-way valves and these circuits like this, okay? So just to remind you, you take the 10 feet and we, we have to convert that to PSI. So we're gonna divide by 2.3, 2.31, but this stuff for Bell and Gossett, they just kind of use 2.3. It matches the numbers in here better. So that's fine. So uh, that's 4.3. Uh, say three, five uh, PSI. And then we're gonna take the square root of that because <clears throat> that's what the valve equation says. And we get 2.085 and I'm gonna store that away. And then I divide that into the 60 GPM, 60 divided by that 2.085 number. And I get um, 28, 28.9 would be um, the desired, but then I have to go all the way back to my, oops. I'm looking for basically, um, let's see. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't go above. So it's like, I'm looking for 28.8, but um, if I go above, it's a larger valve and I won't have 10 feet, okay? So I have to uh, go down from say 28.8 or 29. Well, it's not 29. If it was 29, I could, I could use the uh, two and a half, but I can't because that's a little bit too large and I won't have my 10 feet. And so I won't meet my the design criteria. So I guess the next one is what 26. 
uh, I think 26 is the next one on the list. So we go back to here. See, we selected the CV of 26. Now, if we want to see what the actual pressure drop will be, I take my GPM divided by 26, and that's 2.3. And then this time I have to square it. Uh, and then I have to multiply by 2.3 to get to feet of head from PSI times 2.3. And so it's 12 point, uh, it's a little over 12 feet. So it's actually 12.25, but anyway, <laughs> in the Bell and Gossett stuff, they dropped the 0.25. So they say this results in a 12 foot pressure drop at 60 GPM for the valve. Okay, so then that total circuit, and that's from the pump all the way through the coil and back around to the pump suction is the 14 feet that you were given plus the 12 feet for the control valve. So circuit two has a total drop of 26 feet. Okay, so now we wanna to try to balance one and three to 26 feet because if when we have, uh, the desired flow and the same pressure drop, and then that flow will just automatically distribute itself properly through all those coils, and we'll have a per perfectly balanced system. Okay, so looking at circuit one, we're shooting for 26, and I've got uh, eight feet in the coil and, and uh, the balance valve and everything else. So that's, uh, uh, we need uh, what, 18? because 18 and the eight we have is 26 and that would balance it perfectly. Okay, so we can calculate the, the closest. And I mean, he's at this point, they're kind of assuming that you know how to do this. We'll go through this one more and then we'll just take his numbers from uh, here on. So if, if I'm shooting for 18 uh, feet, then I take my 18 divided by 2.3 and then if I had a specific gravity that wasn't one, I'd divide by that, but you know, we're, we're kind of glossing over the specific gravity here. And then I take the square root of this and that's about 2.8, store that away. And then I take my 40 GPM divided by recall and I'm shooting for about 14, okay? Well, so the closest I have is 15, and so it's okay on this circuit because I, I mean, I'm well above 10, so I can go up or down in CV in order to match as close as I can. Because it, at the end of the day, I still have the balance valves and I can make up a foot or two here or there by using the balance valves. So the closest to this 14.3 is 15. So I'm gonna choose the 15. So then I wanna know what my actual head loss is across that valve. So I take my 40 GPM divided by the 15 equals this, square it times 2.3. And um, I'm getting 16, I'm getting 16.4, but anyway, they've listed this as 17. See if I did that right, make sure. Uh, CV of 15. So, you take 40 uh, divided by 15 equals this squared times 2.3. Yeah, I did it right. So anyway, they list 17 in the presentation. So we'll go with that. Um, so that says that the uh, total number one circuit with that valve control valve wide open is gonna be 25 feet. So. I'm a foot short, but I got a balance valve, so that's not really an issue. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so that's, yeah, that's all in number one. Okay, then we go to number three and we go through the same procedure. Um, and so we require, um, the calculation says we're shooting for 11.4, we've got an 11. So that 11 gives 17 uh, foot pressure drop. Uh, at 40 GPM. Mm, you know what? 
that's a typo because this is circuit number three and it should say 30 GPM. So apologies, that's a typo in my slides. But at any rate, we go through this sizing procedure. We come up with 17, 17 and 10 is 27. So that's one over. So to kind of summarize what we have now, uh, circuit number one, 40 GPM at 25 feet, circuit number two, 60 GPM at 26 feet, and circuit number three, 30 GPM at 27 feet. So the, uh, some of our criteria that we have to check, the variance in uh, circuit pressure drops is well within the 25%. You don't want them varying by more than 25%, and they're, they're pretty close to right on top of each other. Uh, if circuits number one and two have their balance valves set to bring their uh, pressure drop up to that of circuit number three, so we would crank a two foot drop on the balance valve in number one and a one foot drop on number two, and then everything would be balanced at 27. Um, let's see, so we'll do that. And we have to check the, uh, the distribution piping AC plus BD, the pressure drop in those. That's see this is common pipe on the back side over here. See all that's in all of the loops, so that doesn't matter. But you know because from AC to ah, to BD that piping is not shared by all of the circuits, and so that's the one that we're referring to here in this in this uh, next to last bullet. So we wanna make sure that that drop uh, is no more than 50% of the 27 feet. So when you size that pipe, that would be the design criteria on that pipe size. Uh, so, um, and so, I mean, that's just, you, you would just select it with that. We don't have any more guidance on that in this problem. And so the pump for the system would be selected for 130 GPM at 27 feet of head. And you can call up the pump suppliers, they'll size it for you, or there's online selection tools, the Bell and Gossett stuff. You just put that in and click on the model that you're interested in, and it'll show you if it's uh, uh, applicable. And you can look at the pump curve and see if you like the location on the pump curve and all that sort of thing before you spec it. Okay. Let's move on to example number four. Now, instead of two-way control valves, we're gonna to go to three-way uh, valve controlled. Uh, it's a two-zone below control valve. Okay, so here's some sizing criteria. Control valve should generally be rated at a pressure drop three times that of the coil or greater up to a maximum of 20 feet. Okay, so for the three-way valves, we have a different criteria that we had with the two-way valves. The two-way valves, we were looking at a minimum of 10 feet um, on the selection of the first one, and then we were trying to match on the other uh, circuits. On this one, we're gonna say we want uh, three times or greater um, uh, the, the coral drop up to uh, a maximum of 20 feet. So applying that, so we look at uh, zone number one first because it has the uh, greater pressure drop. It has 60 GPM at six feet. Okay. So uh, three times six is uh, 18. So we're shooting for 18 and we could go up to 20. So we don't want less than 18 and we don't want more than 20. So if you go through the uh, sizing, the required valve CV is, is uh, 21.4. So we can check that. We take the 18 divided by 2.3. This uh, square root, it's about 2.9, store one. And then we have the 60 GPM divided by that number and we get 21.4. So that one comes out right on it. Um, our closest selection there is 21. And so if the CV is lower, it's a, a smaller valve. 
So it's gonna have a little bit more pressure loss. Okay, so we need to check that and see what that pressure loss, make sure it doesn't go over 20. And so then we take the 60 divided by 21 equals this, uh, square root times 2.3. Yeah, boy, that didn't work out right at all. <laughs> Let me try that again. Oh, me. Let's see. So 60 divided by 21 is this. Oh, I, I, I said square root. You got to square this one. It's easy to get confused. Times 2.3. Yeah, uh, 18.78. So that rounds to 19 comfortably. So that's correct. Okay. So we're gonna put uh, in that first circuit, that control valve is gonna have a CV of 21. And that'll give us a 19 foot drop, which is more than three times the coil. So we've met our design criteria on. On these, uh, they give you the breakdown on the circuit. On those first three, you were just given a total. Uh, so here we see the coil. And it's because we're, we're sizing these based on the coil drop. So they have to provide that information separately. So we're seeing the coil uh, six foot, our control valve, we just sized to 19. They're saying the circuit balance valve that's in the wide open position would be two feet. And the rest of the piping is two feet. So when we total that up, that first circuit over here to the left, all the way around from the pump all the way through the coil and back around is gonna have a 29 foot uh, drop at the design flow of 60 GPM, okay? So now we're just gonna to try to match zone two uh, to that 29 foot. And we looked on zone two and it's, uh, oops, um, 40 GPM. And that coil is, uh, has a five foot drop. That's the coil selection. Okay, so three times five is 15. However, we can go above that as so long as we don't go above 20. Okay. All right, so uh, if you look at uh, zone two, uh, everything that we know, the coil is five, the uh, balance valve wide open is two, and the piping is another two. So we've got nine feet total, and we're shooting now for uh, what, 29, okay? So a valve selected for 20 foot, which is okay, we can do that uh, at 40 GPM. So, you know, we can calculate what the CV is. I mean, they, they show it there, but uh, let's see. So 20 feet divided by 2.3 equals this. This time it's square root 2.95, store one. And that's 40 GPM divided by recall one. Yeah, 13.6. And they're rounding all this stuff to 14. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, in this case, we've our closest match in our little table back there is 15, which results in not quite 20, but it's still more than the 15, which we need for controllability. And so the 15 is fine. So that gives us the 17 foot drop at 40 GPM. So let's see, did we get a, no, we didn't, we just have to add that to it. So we had, uh, let's see, so what, nine and 17 is 26. So we're gonna have to use the balance valve to make up that other three feet by just cranking that shut a little bit. The test and balancing guys come in and measure that and crank it in and measure the flows. And, but it should, it should work if all of our other uh, pressure loss numbers are correct, okay? So that's what we would do on example number four here. <clears throat> oh, we're not done. <laughs> uh, he's got some more notes on this. Uh, the uh, bypass balance valves on both zones must be adjusted to simulate the coil pressure drop uh, when the no load condition occurs. So they're, now they're talking about so actually we have two balance valves in there. This one is to simulate the coil to make the bypass pressure loss look just like the coil pressure loss. So that's what this is referring to, these two guys. These are the circuit balance valves that, 
that we were gonna have to adjust three feet into this one, this one would stay open down here, okay. So the bypass valve on zone one should provide a six foot of drop because that's the coil drop at 60 GPM. <clears throat> and zone two should give what, five foot at 40 GPM. Oh, and we can calculate the required CVs for those because those valves have to be sized as well. And so uh, let's see. So we want uh, six feet. Okay, uh, so six divided by 2.3 is 2.6 square root, 1.62 store one, and then we take 60 divided by that, and we get 37, so that's correct. And then on the second one, we've got five feet, so we take the five divided by 2.3, this square root, or one, and now we've got 40 divided by that, 27. So those are dead on for the CVs on the bypass balance valves. That's what they would have to be set for. Okay. All right, last example. Uh, this system has three air handling coils controlled by three-way mixing valves. Uh, control valve on zone two, size first, because it's got the largest drop. So it's got six foot drop at 200 GPM, pretty good size coil. Um, at the three to one ratio, so three times six is 18. So that drop can any, be any place from 18 to 20. And you can go through that calculation, but the required valve CV is 72. And the closest we can come to that uh, is 68. So that's a smaller valve, larger drop. So we have to make sure we don't go above 20, but when we check it, we get 19. And so bingo, we've got the sizing done for that control valve on number two. Okay, so then we look. So the coil is six, control valve 19. Uh, the open balance valve is two and the piping is four. So we've got 31 for the total zone drop. Uh, Assuming that zone one and zone three each have the same piping and balance valve, wide open pressure drops, they're balanced as closely as possible to zone number two. And you should punch through all that. I mean, Ollie, I'm not gonna go through each one of those. We've been through quite a few of them, but you should check that and make sure that uh, you agree with the uh, control valve sizing and the uh, CVs, okay? Uh, let's see, we're just about done here. Uh, to obtain maximum design balance, the total valve plus coil pressure drops should be equal for all zones. Uh, or certainly as close as you can get them. Minor differences can be made up by mechanical balancing. We've talked about that. Bypass balance valve should be set to create the same pressure drop as their respective coils. We saw that on the previous example. And then the total pressure drop of the distribution piping, uh, AB plus B, uh, C, D, in this case, should not exceed 50% of the individual zone pressure drop. So uh, if we assume a piping length here, so we're saying that we've measured on the plans or whatever, uh, and that should be AB, there's another mistake, AB plus CD, uh, that length is 300 feet. The uh, total pressure drop allowable then is uh, five foot per hundred because we've got roughly, we got 31. So 30, half of 30 is 15. It's really 31. So it's actually 15 and a half. But uh, so then if we're 300 feet, if we're five foot per hundred, then three times five is 15. So that would be allowable. And he makes a comment here, since uh, normal maximum allowable design drop for noise reasons is four per hundred, even so saying because of noise, if you go, if, if you're pushing harder, you have more drop than four foot per hundred, you have noise in the system. So they don't let them go above that. So we could go five, you know, for the control 
sizing, but for the noise sizing, we're gonna be four. So we'll be fine because your pressure drop will be less at uh, the, uh, the lower frictional loss, which means you have lower velocity in the pipe. So we would be good. So we would size that at uh, you know, four foot per hundred, whatever pipe size that gave us for the various flow rates. Okay, woohoo, questions. That's what I feel like. I don't know about you guys. Was going into the last week of the semester next week. All right, now we get to have some real fun. I like this stuff. I like this primary secondary. And I don't know if this is good or not. I have never uh, gotten PowerPoint written on this. So we're gonna just go through this uh, technical manual. Uh, that's where I have gotten, you can find these on the Bell and Gossett there under their uh, uh, education or information. I don't know exactly where the tab is, but you, there, there's a whole bunch of these things listed on their website and you can just download, that's what I did. I just downloaded them and uh, made PowerPoints out of most of them, but I never made it on this one. So anyway, and we only got 54 pages to go in two and a half classes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't turn out to be that bad. The first uh, couple pages of this a little tedious, uh, but we need to really hone in uh, on this. Make sure we understand, uh, we get the general concept right here. So that, that's a pretty simple uh, uh, diagram, but this allows the definitive statement uh, for the basic ground rule for a design of primary secondary systems. So we got the fundamental circuit listed over there in figure two. And so you've got a primary pipe and here they're showing a one pipe primary. So it's like, if that's carrying hot water, it leaves the boiler at 200 degrees and it just circulates out and it comes back at 120 degrees and then it goes through the boiler again. And so each secondary is gonna get a different temperature because it's gonna pull some water off, it's gonna cool it down and it's gonna dump it right back into the same pipe. Well, I mean, if you go through three or four, five, six zones, that water is gonna get cooler, right? Because you're taking heat out of it. Or if it's chill water, you're putting heat into it, it's gonna heat up. So this is not necessarily, it's gonna get more sophisticated than this, but this is the basic simplest diagram that you can draw. So all primary secondary control methods are finally referenced to the use of a common pipe or common piping. And so what they're saying here is we have two circuits. We have our primary circuit, which we just show a little bit of because you got a boiler back here and you got it all the way down to the end of the building and comes all the way back to the boiler. Well, that's your primary circuit. And then each coil, so each space that has a terminal unit has a coil in it and so, it has a secondary and we can have umpteen gazillion secondaries coming off of this. You know, they're just showing one here. Okay, because they wanted to find this common pipe. Okay, and so, you know, if you trace out all the piping in the secondary, you come up here, you go through the coil, you come back, all this, but guess what? This common pipe is part of the secondary. You don't have a full loop without it, okay? Likewise, in the primary, it comes down and that common pipe is also a part of the primary. So this little piece of pipe from here to here is called the common pipe. Okay, and that's, it turns out to be a big deal. It allows all this stuff to work. So common piping is defined as a length of piping common to both the primary and secondary circuit flow paths, purposely designed to extremely low pressure drop. So we want that daggum common pipe to be as short as we can make it, okay? We don't want any pressure drop from this point to this point. That's critical. So the, the whole idea here is to have zero pressure drop between those two points of connection. Now, is it possible to have zero pressure drop? No, because even if you just put fittings together, you know, with a little stub of pipe, in between your T's, there's still gonna be a little bit of friction. And so you're never going to achieve this 100% perfectly, but the art of engineering is getting close enough, okay? 
and we can certainly get close enough. Uh, the common uh, piping length is quite short and can vary uh, as between a close nipple connection uh, to an approximate maximum length of two foot. So Bell and Gossett says that as long as you want that common pipe to be is two feet. That's a long one. Okay. This provides for a minimum of pressure drop in this piping length and ensures hydraulic isolation. Well, that's a big fancy term. Hydraulic isolation of the secondary circuit from the primary. Well, what does hydraulic isolation mean? Okay, it means it's defined pretty well in this next sentence. Flow in the primary circuit will not cause flow in the secondary circuit because of low pressure drop in the common piping. So if you think about it, if you connected these two and there's a big pressure drop between these points, then you got high pressure on this side, low pressure on this side, you're gonna force flow up through that secondary anytime there's flow through the primary. And that's a no-no, you don't wanna do that. So how do you get hydraulic isolation? You make the pressure drop between these two points of connection as small, infinitesimally small, which means then you get essentially no flow because that you're flowing the primary. Now, how are we gonna get flow in the secondary? We're gonna put a pump and we're gonna, we're gonna put flow when we want it and we'll design all of that. But the fundamental concept here of the common pipe is that we keep this pressure drop small and we have hydraulic isolation between the secondary and the primary. So flow in the primary will not induce flow in the secondary if that pressure drop is small. Okay, that's the big concept, big concept. Got to get that one. Uh, so having this pressure drop small provides for minimum pressure drop in this piping and ensures hydraulic isolation of the secondary circuit from the primary. Flow in the primary will not cause flow in the secondary because of low pressure drop. Okay, so I've beat that to death about as much as I can. So that's one point that you got to get down. Okay, secondary, a secondary circuit pump is used to establish secondary circuit flow. So when we want flow, okay, let's put a little pump in and we'll turn the pump on when it gets cold and we'll pump some hot water through the coil and then we'll get warm. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. So this is the way they, we show it, okay? Now let's look at the notes on this. The uh, secondary circuit pump is sized to provide design flow rate through the secondary circuit with reference to secondary circuit pressure drop only. So this secondary uh, pump is only looking at the pressure drop from A to B to C to D to E, you know, the, the coil certainly to E to G to H to I. And basically we're saying there is no pressure drop from A to I, so you don't really, I mean, you don't have to worry about that, okay? Because that's how we've designed it, okay? So since the common piping pressure drop A to I is slight, um, it will have no effect on secondary circuit pumping requirements, as I just said. And the secondary circuit can be considered separately and in hydraulic isolation from the primary. So this is a big deal because then, you know, if you've got a huge building, you can have your de design team, one team's designing the primary, and you got 15 teams designing all these, these secondaries, and they can go work independently and then bring their results back and merge them together. So that's, that's one benefit. Um, in primary secondary application, the primary secondary circuits are treated separately. Uh, secondary circuit pump heads have no effect on the primary circuit pumping head requirements and vice versa. So, you know, you can turn on and off the secondaries as you wish, and the primary doesn't know anything about it. Now, if you turn off the primary, you know, the pump won't care, but if you don't have primary flow, then you won't have heating or cooling. So the zones will care. So, but, but the pumps are, are isolated from each other. 
this singular fact from it on uh, the large system as though it were a number of small systems. The function of the primary circuit uh, simply becomes one of heat conveyance to or from the secondary while the secondary circuit serves uh, the terminal heat transfer units. So if it's a heating system, the primary takes hot water from the boiler, makes it available to the secondaries. The secondaries can take some of it or not, depending on whether they need heating. And so that primary loop is conveying heat out, making it available. And then, like I said, the secondaries take it if they need heat at that point in time or not. Uh, since secondary circuits are energy head isolated from uh, large primary pumps, the control problem in the secondary circuit is minimized. Uh, pressure ratio increases across control valves, et cetera, can be set low because secondary pump heads are low. In effect, control isolation is achieved with a remarkable decrease in operating problem. So what they're talking about here is a lot of times these primary pumps uh, are pretty high head. They develop a, a pretty high pressure. And so if that pressure affects what goes on in here, then that high pressure affects control valves and all that stuff that are back up here in the secondary. But you, know, you could have a high pressure at A and a high pressure at I, and there's no differential pressure. So then this, that high pressure does not affect the control valve sizing in the secondary. And that's a big deal as far as controllability and keeping your control valve costs down and all that sort of thing. So another big advantage. So, you know, if you get out there and you're designing hydronic system for big buildings, this is what you're gonna be doing, some form of primary and secondary. Um, the simple design procedures that will follow uh, rules and definitions will establish other uh, design advantages. Okay, so some of these advantages are designed to deep primary circuit temperature drops with corresponding reductions in primary pump and pipe size. So let's go down to this figure because this is, <clears throat> this is the way this stuff usually gets put in. So my primary is down here. So this is my primary supply line. And then, you know, so I, so I got my supply running all the way down and then all my secondaries have what they call a crossover a connection, and then this is the return pipe. So they don't really pull out of the, the one pipe primary and dump back into the one pipe primary. So this way you can get the same temperature water to all of your secondaries. Makes it much more controllable. Now it's possible to design a one pipe primary, but you don't see them. I mean, it's not done very often for the typical application. This is what you see. So this would be the supply, primary supply, this is the primary return over here. And then we put a crossover bridge in between that's balanced for whatever maximum flow this guy needs up here. And so it's flowing down here and then the pump can either take it or not take it. And so it's gonna, it's gonna tap off here and it's gonna wind up over here in the return. The question is, is it gonna go through the secondary or not? And that depends on the operation of the secondary pump, whether it pulls it in there or not. Okay, but so by doing this, I could have 250 degree water over here and put that in my crossover bridge. It, but I don't really want to put 250 degree water through my coil. And so what you can do is you can have this pump pump more water than goes through the crossover. And so the crossover flow actually takes return water and brings it backward and mixes it at this T. And so then you can temper that water instead of 250, you could, and we'll talk a lot about this as we go through this. But so instead of 250 water, you could put maybe 150, 170, 180, which is more appropriate to go through the coil. And then when this pump runs, that tempered water goes through the coil and then comes back and part of it goes back to the return and part of it recirculates to mix with more 250 degree water at this T. But what that allows is a big temperature difference on your primary, 250 and this might be like 140 coming back. The bigger that temperature difference, the smaller the flow rate and the smaller the pump and the smaller the pipe to convey a given amount of energy. And so that's what this first 
bullet point is referring to. Just primary circuit temperature drops with corresponding reduction in primary pump and pipe size. So that's a huge advantage. Now you don't get that on the cooling side because you can't, you can't make water minus 20 degrees because if you do, you have a hard time pumping it. Now, some, some places do uh, do that with, uh, for freezers for like glycol systems. So you can take a glycol solution and make it really, really cold and provide that cold flow to a freezer and food processors and things like that that have these large freezers do that sort of thing, okay? Um, but for general air conditioning, we're probably the coldest water we're probably gonna make is really cold water would be 38 to 40 and most of the time it's 42 to 45. And so you don't get all of this, you, you can't jack the temperature way down on the typical chiller for air conditioning. So that applies primarily to heating. Um, simple effective control methods in the equipment room, uh, boiler and chiller application. So this allows for simplicity in the primary design in the control rooms. Uh, outside air handling coil design methods for freeze protection uh, come right along with this primary secondary uh, technique and application to uh, heat cool zone switchover. So we'll see some stuff on that later on. Okay. Uh, location of the secondary circuit pump. So this is primary secondary rules and definitions. Okay, the secondary pump should always discharge into the secondary circuit. So it should be sucking right out of the primary or the crossover bridge, which we're showing in this case. And because this becomes the point of no pressure change for the secondary, okay? And if you put over here, then you have a small drop until you get to the pump, but then you drive the pressure in the secondary up. If you put it over here, then it's the old thing where we're gonna suck the pressure down all the way around the loop until we get to the pump. And we don't wanna do that. So it's, it's the same argument that we've already had. It just applies to uh, the secondary pump. Uh, so when we pump into the secondary, this provides an increase in secondary circuit pressure over that established in the crossover bridge by the primary pump, okay? The uh, common piping can be considered as the uh, compression tank, uh, no pressure change point. It is consequently generally wrong to pump into the common piping from the secondary because of the decrease in secondary circuit static pressure. So that's just what we just talked through all that. So four is right. These are pretty good. This is an excellent document. It's a little tedious at times, but it's pretty good. And so, that, so they show you what it looks like if you do it right, and it shows you what it looks like if you do it wrong. So if you do this, unless you've got some special, special reason, then you're probably doing it wrong. So you don't want the pump on this side of the secondary most of the time. There are, there's an exception we get to later. Okay, crossover bridge. So I mentioned the crossover bridge, but... So crossover bridge is the cross connection between primary supply main and primary return piping. Uh, it provides primary design flow rate to the common piping. So you go off in your secondary, you run your loads, say it's a heating situation, I need 200,000 BTUs an hour. You know, you have to establish what's my primary uh, water temperature going to be 200, 225, 250. And then, you know, what am I going to size my coil for in my secondary? So maybe I'm going to have 140 degrees coming out of the coil. So then that's my, you know, I've got a delta T to work with there. And so I can figure out uh, what my flow rate needs to be. And then, so I size this uh, crossover for that. So that's my crossover. And then here's my connections to the secondary and there's my common pipe in between. And so then the common pipe is really between, I mean, it's between the primary through the crossover bridge back to the primary and the secondary. So it's in both of these circuits, that little piece. 
Uh, the bridge contains balancing valves and may contain a flow indicator. Uh, it's quite often underslung to simplify initial air venting problem. Okay, so this is uh, uh, an underslung crossover, and this would be an overhead crossover. So they get designed both ways, depending on the building and how much room you got and where they can run pipe and all of this sort of thing. Okay, this is really preferred for air venting because say any air in the secondary, if you got your velocities, it's gonna make it up to the crossover bridge and then it can rise, you know, because that air wants to rise through the water, it's easier to get it into the primary return and the primary return should pull it back to what? The point of air separation and then it goes you know, either to the compression tank or it gets vented from the system if you have automatic air vents. Okay, so that's pretty good. Now we're gonna talk about crossover bridge and overhead <laughs> crossover. While the underslung bridge is generally preferred, overhead crossover bridges are also employed. Sometimes you just get forced into it and you don't really have a choice. So this would be overhead. The uh, overhead crossover bridge cannot become airbound and will continuously purge air, providing the piping pressure drop from the primary supply main to the primary return main, or this delta P that we're indicating on this diagram. So the delta P between here to here, because you're gonna have more pressure on the primary side than on the return side in this, primary loop. Um, so that delta P expressed in feet of water is greater than H, the height of the crossover. So if you can respect that, then this thing will vent air on its own. So that's one design criteria. Okay. Uh, this is the usual case. Should height H and you know, who knows, there's always an exception out there. Should height H become greater than the estimated delta P or when uh, downfed uh, secondary circuits are used from an overhead uh, crossover, a manual air vent should be employed as we're showing in A. So if this thing is too tall and the pressure drop from here to here expressed in feet ahead is not as great as the height, or if you're down feeding a secondary, because see what's gonna happen when we separate air in the secondary, it's gonna wind up up here. And if this is too high and we don't have the right pressure, then we're gonna get an air bound crossover and this thing won't, won't work. So then we gotta put in a manual air vent. So when, when we get this thing filled up and we start using it, we can come and bleed the air out of the system until we get just water flow here and then you just crank that thing shut, okay? So, lots of ways to screw up out there in the world. I've done a few of them. Uh, and this note at the bottom, overhead crossover bridges should be designed to a minimum velocity on the order of two feet per second. There's our two feet per second number that we've seen before, which is enough velocity to pull bubbles downward in a flow and get them through a piping back to a point of air separation in order to drive any accumulated air down the crossover return and into the primary return main. So there you go. All right. Another note here, crossover bridge length. Crossover bridge can be as long as necessary for interconnection between the primary and secondary circuits. So you have to pipe size it accordingly. All right, speaking of pipe sizing, we'll go on to point five here. Crossover bridge pipe sizing. Crossover bridge is generally pipe sized to a piping friction loss uh, ranging from and this is a hundred mils, milli inches per foot. God, I hate milli inches per foot. That's awful. Just do approximately one foot 
of uh, loss per 100 foot of piping to four foot of loss per 100 foot of piping. And that four foot number was our limit for noise generation. We didn't want to go above that. Uh, and of course, to the required primary flow rate. So there's your pressure drop numbers uh, for the crossover, one foot per 100 to four foot per 100 at the desired flow rate. And then you can go to the pipe sizing chart and figure out what size pipe that you need. Now, um, let's see here. Okay, so this, uh, when the required primary flow rate is equal to secondary flow rate, crossover bridge, common pipe, secondary pipe are all the same size. So this would be probably a uh, air conditioning or a chill water application because my secondary is requiring 40. And so my crossover is sized for 40. And so when the secondary is taking water, what's gonna happen, this pump's gonna run in the secondary and 40 GPM, or 40 GPM is flowing through the crossover. When that pump runs, that 40 GPM is gonna be sucked by that pump right out here. And it's gonna go through probably an air conditioning coil and it's gonna come back. So it's going in at say 42, coming back at 52, 53, 54, and it'll flow right through this and right back into here. And there'll be no flow. When that pump runs, there'll be no flow in the common pipe. When the pump does run, it will just bypass the secondary and go directly into the return, okay? So, so all of the crossover and the secondary, everything sized for 40 GPM, that's pretty simple, okay. Uh, let's see, quite often the primary flow rate will be considerably less than secondary, and that's typically in a hot water system. Uh, when the common piping is part of the uh, crossover piping, special application uh, procedures should be followed to prevent any jet flow through the common piping. So what they're talking about here is Let's say that this is a heating situation. Uh, let's see, and so because I've got really hot water in my primary, I only need 10 GPM to convey the heat that I need, but my secondary flow is still 40. Oh, so my initial pipe sizing for the crossover bridge is one and a quarter, which is selected for the 10 GPM, okay? I'm one and a quarter, but see when I get down here, if, if I got one and a quarter coming through the primary, but I got 40 being pulled into the secondary, well, what happens? Well, I've got 40 coming back here, 10 of it goes into the return and 30 of it flows backward through the common pipe and mixes at this T and then goes out. So I've got 40 through this pipe, I've got four in all through the secondary. I've got 40 in this pipe. I've got 10 here. I've got 10 here. And I've got 30 in the common pipe when the pump runs. So how do I pipe size this? Well, my pipe size for the secondary is two inch. And so what they're saying here is, look, we got we to gotta, uh, expand the pipe size for the common pipe and in the vicinity of this connection. So, you know, and this could be, yeah, you know, this can be as long as necessary. So you don't need the two inch pipe up here because it's only carrying 10 GPM. So you're one and a quarter down here and you get what? Two inch pipe, eight diameters upstream, you do the expansion and then you've got two inch pipe and you're going four diameters downstream on this side. So you run two inch pipe there and two inch pipe is all in your secondary. And then the rest of this is one and a quarter, okay. So those are the rules if you have that. And if you have a heating system, you're probably gonna have this situation because we're gonna be supplying that really hot uh, primary water to downsize that pump and all that sort of thing that we already said. All right, so common pipe length and flow characteristics. Common piping is designed for a minimum pressure drop and we've already said this is uh, the length between a short nipple and approximately two feet, as short as possible. 
uh, common piping flow rate and direction characteristics will be established by the relationship between primary and secondary flow rates. Three basic situations can occur. Primary flow greater than secondary, primary flow equal to secondary, and primary flow less than secondary. So, well, we'll talk about that first one here. An illustration uh, of each will follow. A is primary flow greater than secondary flow. We got in figure 12 right here. Uh, let's see. So we're showing primary flow at 150 GPM. Okay. And then we're showing secondary flow at 100 GPM. Well, so at this first T, what's gonna happen if the pump runs, I got 150 coming in, I got 100 being pulled out by the pump. And so I got 50 continuing on through the, the, the common pipe and we'll just head on into the return. Uh, this 100 that gets piped around the secondary will then come back in and merge with this uh, 50 that went through the common pipe and they'll mix and so I'll have my 150 primary return. Now, I don't think I don't think this gets used very much because why would you just design this thing to waste basically 50 GPM of primary water? What you might do um, just to make sure that you had enough, you might size that for like 110 or something, and then because maybe you're maybe your secondary pump is, you know, I mean, nothing's perfect, you know, so you, you have a little extra supply there just to make sure that you can get your full uh, desired temperature into. So this would probably be like a chill water system, you know, um, say I got 42 degree water, uh, you know, uh, I, I want my, I want to be sure I get my 100 GPM of 42 degree water. So I size that crossover for 110 and I'm willing to waste 10 you know, potentially something like that. But at any rate, and then they, he goes crazy here. He calls this the, 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 the law, the T, the T law. Well, for mechanical engineers, the T law should be pretty simple. Conservation of mass, right? 150 GPM in, 100 GPM out. Gee, how much is in this pipe? I think 50 GPM and it's going this way. I mean, that's what the, that's what the T law is. So that's pretty simple. We can handle that. Okay. And so this is showing in great detail on this one. So 150 in, we pull 100 out here. We got 50 coming through the common pipe. We put our 100 return back in here. They mix here and go back. Uh, uh, hold on a second. I'm getting a call here. I got to take. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh. Oh, perfect. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Oh, that's perfect. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a flat tire this morning and my car laid down on me and <laughs> took a little hike and did all kinds of extra things this morning. But anyway, so that was the repair shop. They got it all fixed and put back together, which is good. Okay, so, I mean, anybody can jump in. Um, I did start recording this, didn't I? Did I start this? Yes. Whew, thank heavens. I get these little flashes in my mind. Did I start recording this? <laughs> okay. So if everybody's got a question, you can jump in on this, but this, this is pretty simple stuff right here. Okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, 
So, okay, let's look at, uh, let's see, what is this common flow? Okay, so this is the second situation where they're balanced. Let's see, is this, yeah, let's just, we don't have to look at the blow up at the T. We can figure that out. Okay, so this is where primary equals secondary. And I mean, this is pretty straight. I mean, this is all pretty straightforward once you kind of get the, the concept. So crossover size 400 GPM. Uh, so it'll be flowing up here. Pump runs, we're gonna pull that 100 GPM uh, up through this T, uh, through the pump. Got a check valve here. Make sure that uh, you know we don't have any flow uh, going the wrong direction when the pump's off. Um, goes through the secondary, comes back around, and uh, so hits T T T B uh, with the pump running. There's no flow in the common pipe, and then that 100 GPM just goes into the return and back to probably the chiller in this case. Um, so also, yeah, we need to note, I didn't note uh, as far as temperature is concerned, but so the temperature here is gonna be the same temperature in the secondary, right? Because I'm taking all of the water and I'm pumping it up here. Likewise, I didn't make that comment up here. Let's go back and make sure that we get that straight too. Because I mean, if I got 150 here and I got 100 here, so then the temperature of the water up here in the secondary has to be the same temperature down here. Now, when this stuff mixes together, I'm gonna to get kind of a mixed temperature over here because I got 50 primary water that's not, not seeing any heat transfer and it's mixing in with the hundreds. So I get a blended temperature over here that goes back into my return. Here, um, with, the, with the flows equal, you know, um, whatever my uh, secondary uh, circuit exit temperature is will be the same thing as my primary return temperature because you know we put all of the all of the flow through the secondary and it just comes back into the primary. So we we need to think about flow. We also need to always think about temperature. What's going to happen with that? Okay, and then of course this is the heating example. <clears throat> which is of great interest to us. So here we're gonna take say 50 uh, GPM of uh, primary flow, and it's gonna come up here to this T. And then when this pump runs, it's gonna pump a hundred. So guess what? When you look at do the balance on this T here, uh, it's got to pull 50 back of this return water that's coming back into this T. 50 of it will go to the primary return and the other 50 will go backwards and mix this T. And then, so the temperature of the secondary, it would be, if it's 50, 50, it'd be the average of the return temperature and the supply temperature. So if this was what, 120, and let's say this was 200, what's that, 320. So then I'd get 160 here that would go through my coil. Okay, and so I could have a 40 degree delta T on my coil. So then that would be the amount of heat that I can put into the space. Okay, let's read the notes on this. Let's see if there's anything I'm leaving out here. Uh, the most important characteristic of uh, system design where secondary circuit uh, flow rate is greater than primary is the mix occurring at TA, uh, common piping flow at a temperature equal to the secondary circuit return mixes with primary water to provide the mixed secondary supply temperature. This most important characteristic provides smooth reset controllability, establishes deep primary circuit temperature drop possibilities, and can be used to great advantage in the numerous primary secondary control arrangements made possible. So understanding this, these differences in flow rates and how this water can mix and then be pumped up through the secondary is critical to understanding primary secondary. Uh, let's see, general prim primary secondary design establishes that the primary crossover bridge flow rate 
will be equal to or less than secondary flow. This means that primary crossover bridge return temperature for the full load condition will always be equal to the secondary return. Okay. So we need to, you know, we just need to be able to understand what the temperatures are going to be depending on what this relationship is uh, between these flows. So we, you know, got a certain temperature here. Uh, we have mixing here. So we'll have a temperature up through here. We come out of the coil with a return temperature and then we come down. So what temperature am I going to have over here? Well, generally speaking, you're going to have this uh, return temperature out of the secondary is going to be here unless I've got water bypassing, primary water bypassing through the common pipe that's mixing that then will uh, adjust that temperature. That's, I don't, I think that's not terribly common really, or just maybe a small amount of it. Mm, let me see now, get where I am, okay. All right, so let's look at, we'll go about one or two more figures here and then we'll stop for today. Uh, start, stop, pump control, start, stop, pump control on. Well, so let's see. Oh, I know, there's a figure left out of this. I remember this. Figure 19 is left out of the document. So, Figure 19 shows the pump on. This shows the pump off. And see, this is figure 20. Um, I have figure 19 from a previous version of this. I will email you out figure 19 so you can have it. But it's the same diagram, except it says pump on. And so, um, and this is uh, crossover flow equals secondary flow. So with the pump on, this 20 GPM just gets pulled up into the secondary and comes around back and down here. Okay, it's pretty simple. And you know, I mean, you could have your thermostat could be, th this could be a radiator. This could not even have air going across it. It could be baseboard radiators, or it could be a coil that has fan blowing air. You could be blowing the air the whole time and you could be starting and stopping the pump for temperature control if you want to. I'm not saying that that might, that might not be the preferred method, but you know, it would work um, certainly. And then, and then you wouldn't have to cycle the fan coming on, coming off and all that wear and tear on the fan motor, whatever. Uh, but of course, if you had ventilation air in there, then you would have that cold air stream coming in. And when the pump's off, you'd be putting cold air in the space, which people probably wouldn't like. So I'm not saying I recommend that, but you could do that. You could, your space thermostat could control the on off action of this secondary pump. More likely that would be a baseboard heater situation where, you know, say in a large atrium or something, you might have baseboard heaters like this with hot water running through them and that heat would rise across all of the wonderful glass that the architect put in there because he wanted it to be so beautiful. And then you had to figure out how to keep them comfortable. Um, and so then, you know, the pump runs or not. So if the pump's off, then the water just bypasses and goes into the secondary or the primary return. I mean, so. so here's start, stop, uh, pump control, pump on, crossover flow, less than secondary. And so, you know, we're just going to go through all of these things multiple times to make sure that you understand. So we're showing 10 GPM for the crossover. When the pump runs, it's pumping 20. So guess what? We're pulling 10 GPM backwards through the crossover, mixing at this point, and then that 20. And if it's a 50-50 ratio, it's just the average of the temperatures would go out to the secondary, 20 GPM comes back, 10 goes this way into the, the primary return and 10 goes into the uh, crossover or the common pipe in the crossover. And then if you turn it off, then the 10 GPM just bypasses and goes directly to the return. I think that's enough. Um, I don't want to pound you just too much today. And we're, we're moving pretty quick. Um, so uh, I hope you're getting this. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, I'm going to cut off the recording now. And...